I am going to the memorial, and it's for various reasons. I was a Jehovah's Witness, and getting past that big glass of wine, sneaking a sniff while passing it on to somebody else, is one of my very first memories. I remember my parents being a bit apprehensive while I handled the glass, leaving their hands under it as I grabbed it so uh, they would make sure that I wouldn't flip it. As I grew up, I became one of the men considered exemplary enough to help pass it along myself. Once, even after spending the whole day setting up the audio in the location where the memorial was going to happen. While I was poemy, I also attended as someone weak in the faith, getting stern, almost condescending smiles inviting me back to the congregation. But I've never been to the memorial as an interested person. And I've never been to the memorial in this version of the religion. You see, the Jehovah's Witnesses have been transforming themselves lately. And I stopped going to the meetings right before the things started to change. The religion I left thought it was the truth because they didn't even know who the people taking the lead were. That you could tell that the governing body was God's chosen channel because of all of the books and magazines that they printed. And that you could tell they were the right religion because they never asked for money. And yet, the religion remained afloat, a sign of Jehovah's hand itself. They had very precise answers for everything, priding themselves on knowing and studying the deep Bible truths that the world ignored. You had to attend freshly shaven, wearing a full suit and tie as a man, or a modest long dress as a woman, if you wanted to be looked as exemplary in the congregation. And the emphasis was on both both reading and on distributing the literature that the governing body produced. That's the religion I left, and almost unfortunately, I can never go back to it, because that religion no longer exists. So by going back, I would not only experience the memorial as an interested person who has never been to the religion, the exact kind of person that the Jehovah's Witnesses are taught to pay attention and love bomb, but I would also get to see this new version of the religion. And I was curious as to how different things would feel like. How familiar would it be? How many women wearing pants and how many men wearing beards would I be able to see attending like that for the first time to a memorial? How many people would there be? Would it be packed to the brim like most memorials I remember? And if I was going to go, I was going to record it so I could document it for all of us to see. So I got ready. I knew that I didn't even want to try to pass as a Jehovah's Witness, not just because I wanted to get the experience of being a worldly person who doesn't know anybody, but because I wasn't going to cover up my tattoo or get a haircut or take off my earring or even take off my nail polish for that matter. Instead, I wanted to wear a black leather jacket with a zipper on the shoulder where I could put my phone to record. My partner would also attend and help me record. I took it from there and emulated the way that interested people showed up to the memorial from memory with black pants and a white shirt to make it a little bit more formal. I don't have black leather shoes right now, so these sneakers would have to do. And as a final touch, I wore this tie that resembles my signature Caleb t-shirt. And after adding a few accessories, I was ready to go. I ended up wearing a light black scarf to try to distract even further from my phone. And I reminded myself, my name, Caleb, and my story. We're traveling and we got told about the memorial from a stand. So let's go. So we are 10 minutes away from the Kingdom Hall. I'm hoping I I'm hoping it's not gonna be bad. I'm hoping I don't want to bother anybody. I, I thought about making a live stream about this, but in, I even checked into the legality of it. Uh, but if somebody comes in and introduces themselves and like, I don't know, like I don't want to film anybody specifically. Not because it's illegal, it is totally legal because it's considered a public event and because I have an invitation for it and because I can just record it here, right? It, it's, it's not illegal, it's just I don't want to be an asshole. Uh, and I feel like if I live stream and then and maybe like showed someone's face for a prolonged period of time or like th their names or whatever, 
you know, they would feel like their privacy were, was somehow violated, even if nothing illegal happened. And I don't know if I'm gonna partake, if I'm honest, just because I have like a lot of social anxiety. And again, like I don't wanna make anybody feel uncomfortable. But if I, if I feel like I won't make anybody feel uncomfortable, and if I feel like I can like I can do it despite the social anxiety and stuff, I don't know, maybe 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 I'll partake. I don't I don't know. I don't I don't know though. Like I just it's I I'm, my hands are sweating already. So it's just this is huge for my agoraphobia and my social anxiety. Like I, I'm I kinda have to like put them aside to be able to do this. So you know, uh, let's let's just let's just uh, wish us luck. Going up to the Kingdom Hall, I was very nervous. I could just try to remember my story and that my name was Caleb. I'm just Caleb. Hola, aquí es el memorial yeah. en inglés. Sí. Uh -huh. oh. Bienvenidos. Yeah. Hola. Marcelo, mucho gusto. Daniel. Daniel. Rindala. Yeah, I fucked up very early on. Despite me literally responding to the name Caleb in so many scenarios, my mind completely blanked and I ended up giving my real name by accident. I just had to roll with it. We arrived just a few minutes before it started and I seated on the edge of the Kingdom Hall, which was fairly empty. However, an attendant immediately revealed why it was so empty when he asked us to move to the middle of the hall. They were keeping the sides of the hall empty and forcing everybody to sit in the middle. I guess so it would look more packed? This is where I see that I completely fucked up with the recording and didn't use the wide angle, so most of my shots are terrible, which is why I'm recounting you here what happened instead of just showing you. The elderly couple in front of us immediately introduced themselves and told us that they were from Canada and were with their daughter and with their husband, who politely nodded at us in a way that every Jehovah's Witness is familiar. I took the chance to look around. Although the memorial was about to start, and although the speaker came from elsewhere with his family and said that there were people from a nearby town in that congregation as well, hinting at the possibility of at least two congregations joining for the memorial, there couldn't be more than 100 people there. Maybe 50 or 60 people? 70 at the most. Weirdly enough, even though I was waiting for it and listened to the recording again, I couldn't hear a single time they mentioned the attendance, which was a huge departure from my memories, where attendance was the first thing you shared with other witnesses in other congregations about your memorial. The majority of the seats were empty, and most of the witnesses seemed to be in their twilight years, with a few people with disabilities attending on their wheelchairs. A few children, maybe one teenager. There couldn't have been more than five people our age, and that included the guest speaker. I had to travel for an hour to attend since the next closest memorial in English was three hours away in a different direction. And I know for a fact there used to be a large congregation in that city alone. While I knew that some may want to attend via Zoom, the memorial with a wine and specific bread needed for the ceremony and it being the most important event of the Jehovah's Witnesses, I expected the Kingdom Hall to be as packed as it was ever going to be. Instead, there I was in the emptiest memorial I had ever attended, with fewer people than there were during midweek meetings in my all congregation during vacation time. I obviously couldn't help but notice the woman in pants and the man with beards, some with really nice pants and beards. But although it was a little bit weird at the beginning, I immediately got used to it. That's because now more than ever, I could see just how most Jehovah's Witnesses act the same, the same polite smile when they shake your hand, same handshake with two shakes down, same cadence, the same wholesome facade. I was talking to a Canadian old man and his wife, who I had never met before, in a city that I have barely been in, and yet I knew these people. While I was talking to them, a Jehovah's Witness part of me deep inside that I didn't even know I still had instinctively knew the questions that he was expecting me to ask. And I was almost shocked to realize that for most of my life, I would have played that Jehovah's Witness polite and 
courteous role with every other Jehovah's Witness without even thinking. Now, it felt like I knew what I would have done as a Jehovah's Witness without questioning, but for the very first time in my life, I had the option to not play that role. It was shocking to realize how little I had been myself realizing that I had always played the same role that every other Jehovah's Witness plays without thinking. If you've never been a Jehovah's Witness, I, I, I don't think I can explain it. Maybe you've been young with a group of friends who dress a certain way and talk a certain way to feel a part of a group. You'd never act the same with your parents or around your teacher. And in fact, you probably don't act like that with anybody anymore. But for a while, when you were still discovering who you were, you might have just adopted a personality for a while along with some people. People. It felt like that, since they exist in high control groups. Most Jehovah's Witnesses have a specific way of speaking, specific topics they'll talk about, and even specific body language that they use when they're in the kingdom hall or around other spiritual people. That facade even falls off somewhat when you're with Jehovah's Witness friends, but never when you're in a kingdom hall, and especially never when you're attending something as important as the memorial. It was extremely weird to be so far away from home, to be in a place that I have never been around with people who I have never met, and yet a part of me, dare I say it, felt even like I was at home, because I knew everybody there. I knew the role that I was supposed to play, and I knew the role that I was supposed to play as a Jehovah's Witness too. The familiarity to me was extremely unexpected. I expected it to feel very alien, very weird, very different. And yet when I was there, I felt like I had never left. After a little bit of chit-chat, the memorial started with a guy getting on the platform and announcing the melody that we were going to sing. Now, this was a completely new melody for me since I hadn't been in the religion for over a decade, and I was surprised to hear the lyrics. The lyrics weren't about the truthfulness of God's prophecy, or about the new world, or about marching together through Armageddon, which were the kinds of songs that I grew up listening to and singing. It wasn't even one of the songs that I remember singing for the memorial alone. It was about our obedience to the governing body and how lucky we are to have them. This overt veneration of the humans placed by Jehovah in charge was the main difference I saw in this religion. Whereas before the emphasis was on obeying Jehovah, with Jehovah being a dog whistle for the governing body, this religion had stopped pretending and just told people to follow the governing body directly in the past few years. And it has worked, with the speaker literally thanking God for the governing body in his prayer. We do appreciate that. You have uh, pulled down 144,000 from the human race to be a special possession to you, as we just sang, and that they will rule with the Christ and to undo all the terrible things that Adam and Eve and their sin has brought upon us. But as the speech started, with the speaker using the same boring, hypnotic cadence that is so easy to ignore, I immediately felt as bored as I had always felt inside a kingdom hall. I hadn't even brought with me a Bible. So when the speaker quoted a Bible verse, the lady behind us gave us her iPad with the JW app open to the Bible section so we could follow along. This was also fairly new since before they would usually give you an actual Bible. And half of the time, especially for the memorial, 
Israel, it was a brand new one that you could take home. Now that Jehovah's Witnesses have transitioned to be a digital cult, the lady simply gave me her iPad, assuming that I'd know I was meant to use it to look up the Bible verses as a speaker quoted them. And I don't know if I would have assumed that that was what I was supposed to do if that had actually been my first time in a kingdom hall. However, Jehovah's Witnesses are so used to their routine that she didn't even think about it twice. That's just what you do. And as a speaker said, the exact same illustration that I grew up hearing for why we have to die because Adam sinned. There's an illustration that I uh, really appreciate that helped me in the past and may help you understand this aspect. Uh, we all know a baker, right? We all know basically how it's done. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an art form, right? But um, So there's molds that they have. Yeah. What if one of the molds was dented? Could you expect that the cake would be perfect? No. You know that the result of that faulty mold is going to be a faulty cake. It has, it's going to have that dent. So in our case, we're sinners because we inherited that sin. We're faulty because our mold was faulty per se because he chose to disobey then we inherited sin and perfection and the death sentence that comes with that i realized just how little this religion had truly changed despite me not being in a meeting for so long i truly felt like i hadn't missed anything, everything the guy was saying, I had heard a billion times before. Explain the same way, with the same cadence, by a man the same age, and with his same lack of charisma. He went on and on about things that I had heard since my childhood for so long that despite my best efforts, I was actually having trouble not letting my mind wander like I had trained it to do to cope with the boredom of the meetings all my life. Surely it cannot be long until they pass the emblems and we go home. It's been 10 minutes? It's only been 10 minutes? How has it only been 10 minutes? And then the speaker went into a very weird illustration. This illustration it talks about a, a town and that townsfolk, uh, they were they were poor, dying of starvation basically. And they they knew a wealthy man, and they went to that wealthy man and they said, "We're dying, we're dying of starvation. We don't know what we're gonna do. Please, can you help us?" The man let him come into his house, and the, the townspeople were astonished. They came and they saw the artwork, and there was Picasso's, there was Rembrandt's, there was Michelangelo's, the the most beautiful. Uh, art pieces in the world but he didn't stop there he went to a vault and he opened that vault and there was Mona Lisa he took that Mona Lisa he gave it to the town and said auction it off and the proceeds you take it that way you can save yourselves that way I could save you through that uh, auction they uh, they auctioned it off but nobody had enough money so there was a mysterious bidder and it was like oh okay he offered enough to save those people. He bought it. Who was this mysterious bidder? Who was the original owner? But why? Why did he do that? He could have given them the money. He could have, this is to save you. But imagine showing that much love for them that he would risk his most valuable possession. He did that to show the love that he felt for them. And that's what Jehovah has done. He risked Jesus because it wasn't guaranteed that he was going to come and he was going to decide whatever Jehovah wanted him to decide. Why? Because he had free will. Jesus had free will. And Satan was going to be attacking that free will and his faith. So he risked it. Why? Love. Because he loves us. So Jehovah is like a rich guy who is rich despite living in a town where everyone is starving. Sounds like everyone is starving because of the very obvious wealth inequality, but let's carry on. The townsfolk ask the rich guy to help save their town from starvation after seeing just how rich this guy is. And the guy 
goes to his vault where he keeps the Mona Lisa? That's not where the Mona Lisa is. The Mona Lisa is in the Louvre, I've checked. But no, in this world, this guy owns the Mona Lisa and he doesn't even look at it or allows anyone to look at it. He keeps it locked away in a vault. Anyway, he gives the Mona Lisa to auction it off because apparently even though the townsfolk are starving, Someone may just be rich enough to buy the Mona Lisa. And as it turns out, an anonymous buyer bids exactly what the townsfolk need to save the town. And this anonymous buyer? The original owner. That's Jehovah. What? I'm not going to insult you explaining to you why this illustration makes no sense since you very clearly already know that. Instead, I'm just going to point out that just judging by how he screwed up telling the story, it seemed to me that this story has been used to explain the sacrifice of Jesus Christ before. And honestly, instead of making fun of it, I think the Jehovah's Witnesses are spot on in this one. The notion of a God sending his son to fake die for humans so he can forgive humans makes as much sense as a rich guy saving the townsfolk by giving them the Mona Lisa to auction it just to buy it off anonymously. But after a quick trip to the bathroom to literally escape the boredom just for a couple of minutes, we finally got to the emblems. And for the very first time, the speaker made eye contact with me while saying this. Did he know what I was planning on doing? Uh, the third question, who should partake of the bread and the wine? Well, both those with the heavenly hope and those with the earthly hope benefit from Jesus' sacrifice. We understand that. And uh, we appreciate that. But those with the earthly hope do not partake in the emblems. Why not? Well, let's go back to when Jesus instituted the memorial. He did this with those with whom he had made a covenant for his heavenly kingdom, the members of which are limited to 144,000. So he made that covenant with those 144,000, and only those with the heavenly hope partake in the emblems. And those who partake of the bread and the wine tonight should be only the few remaining ones of that number who will rule, rule with Jesus Christ in heaven. And this is easy to understand when we think of a wedding. It's similar, right? Do all the guests partake in the marriage vows? No, just the bride and the groom. But what about everybody else? Well, everybody else is joyfully attending that marriage ceremony, right? So today, those who have that heavenly hope, they will partake in uh, the, the bread and the wine and the emblems, and we will be joyfully attending this ceremony. Well, if he said that I can't, then I guess that just seals it. But it's what he said after what really highlighted how little the Jehovah's Witness Memorial makes sense. When Jesus comes during the Great Tribulation, he will gather his remaining chosen ones to heaven and the observance of the memorial will cease. We won't have the ceremony again because there aren't any more of the 144,000. That's who the covenant was made to. So faithful ones on earth will no longer observe the memorial. You might think, well, does that mean that if I don't partake, I don't benefit from Jesus' sacrifice? No. To benefit from Jesus' sacrifice, we don't we don't need to take or partake of the emblems. Now, or in the future. But why do we need to go then? I honestly don't remember if this has always been the doctrine, but it just shows how stupid the memorial is. In the Jehovah's Witness religion, the memorial is the absolute most important day of the year. And most Jehovah's Witnesses will exclusively think and do memorial stuff that day. Why? Well, because Jesus says, keep doing this in memory of me or whatever. But Jehovah's Witnesses also believe that Jesus was only speaking to the anointed when he said that. So if a regular Jehovah's Witness misses the memorial, it shouldn't be a big deal since it isn't about them, is it? So 
Why is it that the average Jehovah's Witness has to go to the memorial if it's only about the anointed, not about them? And the memorial isn't even going to be celebrated when Jesus raptures the anointed. Doesn't that mean that there is no need to celebrate it in your congregation if there are no anointings there? However, as the speaker announced that they were going to start passing the bread, my hands starting to get sweaty. I realized that maybe, maybe I shouldn't do it. Maybe, maybe I was disrespectful. Maybe the video was already good enough if I just documented this experience. Maybe. This is so dry. How can it be both extremely dry and extremely chewy? It tastes like they used the bread from last year and surely not how the bread tasted when Jesus ate it. Surely nobody would ever eat. Oh my God, the speaker is looking at me. Can I chew without moving my jaw? Oh man, this is... This is the worst. So yeah, it tasted so bad that I genuinely wonder whether or not it was safe for human consumption. And although I made an effort to not look around as if I was looking for a reaction, I honestly didn't see or feel anybody reacting or even noticing me eating the bread. It was so uneventful that I honestly was kind of relieved with my nerves fading away completely. And unfortunately, this is where I fucked up because my phone's memory got filled up and stopped recording. And my partner moved their phone accidentally and also stopped recording too, right before they were going to pass the wine. I know, big L, I was literally depressed when I realized that I had missed it. And I honestly thought of not even releasing this video at all. And again, is why I'm recording all of this. That being said, let me tell you, the wine was far, far better. I feel the attendant was just a bit hesitant to hand me the wine, although I could have just been paranoid. Regardless, he handed me the wine and it was delicious for a sweet wine. It wasn't too sweet like a Lambrusco. It was more like a Shiraz, very fruity and very bright. I could have had the whole glass if I'm honest. And just like with the bread, nobody reacted, nobody said anything and the speech went on. For the very first time, I felt like that invitation to go to the meetings and study with the Jehovah's Witnesses was given directly at me, since we were the only ones who looked like they weren't part of a congregation already. We warmly encourage you to join us at our two weekly meetings, which are held here at the Kingdom Hall. Every Wednesday at 6 p.m. we meet here for our midweek meeting, and on Saturday at 3 p.m. we meet here for our weekend meeting. We, uh, in addition, invite you to visit the website, jw.org, and uh, appreciate the Bible-based content that is available in over a thousand languages. I think that's still number one on the internet worldwide. It discusses topics that appeal to married couples, parents, single ones, teenagers, young children, and all who want to learn. And after another song and prayer, the memorial was finally over. We returned the iPad to its owner and most people made a point of shaking our hands and thanking us for coming and we were out of there. I didn't want to stay after all. I had already partaken from the emblems and I didn't want to wear out my welcome. Plus, in my experience, it's usually only the local Jehovah's Witnesses who stay after the memorial to socialize. And I was neither a local witness nor looking forward to socializing since my social battery was already running extremely low. So we went straight out of the Kingdom Hall. I didn't feel my reaction when I was leaving and driving back home. Rindala say how guilty she felt for being in a place where she could see the indoctrination in action and still be unable to help. But I was mostly still trying to digest the experience. And now, honestly, I feel like my experience was somehow oxymoronic. I was wondering how alien this new version of the religion would feel to me. I wonder how weird it would feel to be among men with beards and women with pants inside of a kingdom hall. I wonder how weird it would feel to not use physical literature or how out of place I would feel as an apostate attending the memorial and partaking on it. But Weirdly enough, my experience wasn't what I expected, because I expected it to feel unfamiliar to me. Instead, it felt like I had always felt inside a kingdom hall. Bored 
and struggling to follow or remember what the speaker had said. If it wasn't because I recorded all of this, I wouldn't have remembered anything outside of that stupid Mona Lisa illustration. And I am sure that nobody that I went to the memorial with will be able to remember the vast majority of what was said in that speech. I would have just remembered the speaker, them passing the bread and wine, and the socializing time they had afterwards. To me, this highlighted one of the main issues this religion has and why I think this religion is unable to convert outsiders anymore. I've been to mosques and churches. In fact, the very last time I prayed to God was as an atheist in the Hananias church in Syria. And I did that because I had always wanted to preach in a church like that. Now, I realize that it's because there was nothing in the Jehovah's Witness religion that makes you feel the same way as when someone goes to pray to a temple like that. Despite me being an atheist, I still understand why people go to a large and intricately decorated church to kneel and humble themselves and beg for help from a higher power. When you do that, you'll feel something. You'll, you'll feel some sense of connection, some spiritual feeling that you will never feel inside of a kingdom hall. The closest you might ever get to feel that is if you ever sing a song and that song accidentally makes you feel anything. And it might have been because there were no videos shown, just as the meetings that I'm used to and I remember. But the weirdest thing about the memorial wasn't me partaking, it wasn't me attending, it was how familiarly boring it all felt. If I had truly been an interested person, invited to the most important Jehovah's Witness event of the year, and I showed up, and the event is a boring 45-minute speech, all given in the same cadence, only slightly interrupted by passing dry bread and wine that I'm not even allowed to have, I don't think I would have ever gone back there. Why would have I gone back? What is there to enjoy? It's like going back to school just to listen to the same 10 lessons over and over again, twice a week for the rest of your life. Except you also have to dress up and you're not allowed to associate with anyone who doesn't also spend their life listening to those 10 lessons over and over again. As I was sitting there, all I could think of was, man, was I really born into the most boring religion slash cult in the world? Could I could I prove that? If, if I wanted to prove that, how could I prove, like mathematically, how could I prove that? And I truly started to just think about how I could make a video about proving that the religion is the most boring religion in the world until I realized that I was doing it because the meeting was so that my brain was just trying to escape somehow. Does anyone even enjoy going to the memorial? Had I been the only one to attend who actually remembers what happened in it? And it made me realize that being a Jehovah's Witness is a constant balance of boredom and anxiety. You're anxious because you're not spiritual enough, but being spiritual always involves engaging with the most boring material ever known to man, which surprisingly keeps getting increasingly boring. So you don't want to spend time doing that because of how boring it is, and that makes you feel even less spiritual and more anxious because only spiritual people will pass them again. Then you keep getting gaslit by the religion telling you how this religion is the happiest religion on earth, and you think that you're not happy, not because there's something inherently wrong and boring and unappealing about their religion, but because there's something wrong with you. So you try to fix it by trying to pay more attention to the meetings and feel bored every time and then feel anxious and guilty about it and the whole thing continues. And I even had a bit of an existential crisis being like, am I wasting my time with this YouTube channel? Am I wasting my time listening to Jehovah's Witnesses when Jehovah's Witnesses don't listen to Jehovah's Witnesses themselves? Is this just all a big waste of time? Is this just all a big joke? I am the only one who listens to it. And you know, only apostates listen to what Jehovah's Witnesses say, but Jehovah's Witnesses don't even know what they say themselves. Is is, is it all pointless? Is my channel point? Is this all pointless? But then I realized that maybe, maybe it isn't. Because I cannot think of anybody being able to pay enough attention to remember what was said in that meeting or pretty much any meeting for that matter. 
Jehovah's Witnesses have literally gone out and said that they don't remember what happens at the meetings. They, ju they just remember how they feel and it makes them feel good because they think that that is sp a spiritual thing. That only means that Jehovah's Witnesses only wake up when they finally give themselves the license to actually listen to what's been said in the platform and to actually, actually, truly think and rationalize what it is that they're saying. The main thing that attending the memorial showed me is that this religion is almost reliant on being as boring as to not let Jehovah's Witnesses listen to what they are supposed to believe. Because once they listen to what Jehovah's Witnesses say from the platform, once they give themselves the license to truly try to listen and truly try to understand why is it that they are there listening to this speech that they've listened over and over again and, and truly wonder, is this really rational? Do I really believe this? Once a Jehovah's Witness starts actually listening to what's being said from the platform, that is when the Jehovah's Witness wakes up. It's time for my Patreon question of the video. Lucy W says, if the JWs had not interrupted your growing up stage, what profession do you think you would have had? I recently found out that my grandma was studying with the Quakers at the same time as the JWs in the 1950s. If Quakers had been a little more persistent, I might not have even been born. What about you? Any near conversions to other religions? I always, always, always wanted to be an entertainer. And I feel like if I had grown up in like a, a nice family, I would have asked them to, you know, let me try to be an actor or like an entertainer or of, of any sort. Every time that I saw the movies, I love to like go to behind the scenes on the movies and just see how they were filmed. And, and my, my heart just like ached for it because I was like, man, I... I, I wish I was there. I wish I was doing that stuff. And I haven't had any close conversions to any other religions. I think Jehovah's Witnesses do such a good job of just turning you off of any other religion. However, if I had to convert and if I had to choose any religion, I think I would become a Buddhist. Buddhists not only have a really good way of seeing the world that doesn't translate on the mass killing of people who don't agree with you. Buddhists, like the proper Buddhists, have the closest we've ever seen to superpower. Like, I mean, pe Buddhist monks, those people are, are insane. They can do things with their, your, their bodies that nobody can do. So if anybody is able to do like modern day miracles, it's them.